Hi, my name's Ilona. I am at Bournemouth University for Eating Disorders Awareness Week, where I'll be doing a speech about eating disorders and the common myths and conceptions around them. Eating disorders are all about secrets and they're all about keeping it to yourself and not sort of telling other people. You might be ashamed about an eating disorder, so I do think that the statistics show only a tiny bit of the larger picture. I do think that probably a lot more people have eating disorders than the statistics tell us. So if that's correct, which is my own theory, but <laughs> um, it means that probably about five or six of you have an eating disorder. That's quite a lot in this small room. So, you know, it could be you, could be you, could be you, could be any of us. It could be men, it could be women, doesn't matter what race you are, doesn't matter what background you come from, anyone can have an eating disorder. So, you know, you can't walk down a street and think, oh yeah, she looks a bit anorexic. You know, that's not a thing. <laughs> you, you can't spot an eating disorder. They do not discriminate. Um, I want to start by saying, well, Andrew's already introduced me as a bit of a journalist, but I also work in television. Um, that's just to pay the bills. My main passion is writing about eating disorders um, to try to put forward the message, um, which is the one that I've just gone through about the myths and stereotypes. The thing that I hate most about this is that I fulfill that stereotype. <laughs> I am white, I'm female, I'm young, and I'm, you know, I'm everything that I say an eating disorder isn't. I fit that stereotype but I'd try my best anyway. <laughs> um, I do what I do because so many people, as I said before, stay silent. So many people find, and I'm sort of getting a bit uh, now, <laughs> um, that it's hard to come out and say, I have an eating disorder. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. Some people are scared that people might not believe them. Some people are scared that people will judge them. Some people are scared to be a burden on those around them who might care about them. And other people are just clinging to a disorder that helps them in some way, and they don't want to lose that. So there's a lot of reasons, and I want to sort of encourage people not to keep it secret, because the longer we do that, the harder it's going to be to get help and it continues that cycle of staying silent and making it something that we should be afraid of or scared of to talk about. Um, people say, I don't know why I've said this now, <laughs> some people say that I'm brave for what I do, <coughs> that I'm brave for being so open about it, that I'm brave for spending years writing about eating disorders. And I say that I'm not brave. I might be for standing up here and doing this because I can feel myself shaking. Um, but I'm not brave for actually being open about eating disorders because it shouldn't be something that we should be brave to do. It should be something that is the same as saying, I had a traffic accident and I've got a pin in my leg. It should be the same as saying, I've got asthma. You, you wouldn't say someone's brave for saying, oh yeah, I've got asthma, or I've got diabetes. And I hate the fact that we should be ashamed at all or be scared to talk about mental health issues in that way. Right, <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. Hopefully I'll relax a little bit. Um, and I'm going to tell you about how my eating disorder developed, how it affected me throughout my life. Um, you might not believe how old I am now, because I still get ID'd when I buy chocolate liqueurs. Um, <laughs> I'm 28 and I had an eating disorder for 20 years. Um, so I was seven when I started um, throwing away my sandwiches at school. I hated eating breakfast, don't know why. I came from a family um, who were middle class, quite normal, 
lived in a two up, two down with a big garden. Um, so we were sort of, you know, not rich, not rolling in it. Um, but my two older sisters are, as they are, were perfect. They were high achievers. They got straight A's in everything they did. They never had a detention in their life. And I didn't want to be like them. I didn't want to be the best at everything. Um, now, perfectionism is a trait that is quite common in anorexia, but I was the opposite. I wanted to be the rebel. I wanted to be different. Um, and even though teachers would sort of write in my book, oh, well done, Claire, crossed out, Janet, crossed out, Ilona. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't want to be associated with them, and I, I admire them, and I love them to bits, and we're still really close now. But I do think that the seeds of my eating disorder were in somehow being jealous of what they had, but at the same time not wanting that. Um, so I was at school. I was active. And it was the new year. And so our teacher asked us to write our New Year's resolutions down in our books. My mum got a phone call. Um, she answered the phone. I was there with her. Um, she answered the phone and they said, look, Ilona's written something that we're quite concerned about. And I said, I was sort of, oh, God, oh, God. And my mum put the phone down and she said, why do you want to lose weight? So at the age of seven, I had written, my New Year's resolution is to lose weight. I don't remember this now. <laughs> this is something that my mum's told me um, since then, and I don't even remember writing it down. I don't remember why I wrote it down, but I did, and I was acting on it as well. So I would go into school, I'd walk to school every day, I'd just throw away my lunch. Um, and at one point, the dinner ladies noticed, and they <coughs> sorry, they called my mum and they said, Ilona's throwing away her lunches. So, of course, I get hung up by my mum again. She's like, why aren't you eating your lunches? I said, I don't like them. don't like sandwiches. So she put me on school dinners. So then I'd go in and I'd be like, right, what do I do now? <laughs> so I used to hide everything. Scoop out a baked potato, hide it all in my potato, throw it away. The dinner lady caught up again, <laughs> and I was like, oh, what do I do now? So my mum comes again. She's like, right, you're not eating your school dinners. What are you going to do now? I was like, right, I'll go back on sandwiches. But then the dinner ladies knew that I didn't eat them, so what I'd do then was get my sandwiches, shove them in my mouth, go to the toilet, throw them out. <sighs> it's nice, isn't it? Um, and then, again, I just kept finding out, I kept finding out, and I kept finding new ways of hiding. Um, I remember one time during high school, which was a bit later, um, my mum once again got me, collared me, <laughs> and she took me upstairs, opened my wardrobe, and my wardrobe was full of mouldy sandwiches. And I was just so humiliated, but I, <clears throat> for some reason, thought, that I'd keep them, no idea why. Um, and this pattern continued, and I kept um, making up reasons and trying to explain to my mum and to everyone that there was nothing wrong. Um, I remember during high school, I would just sit and cradle a bottle of Diet Coke for the whole of the lunch hour and nothing else, and I just could not stand the thought of eating. I'd eat when I was at home in the evening, so I wasn't skeletal, um, but I was underweight and people were starting to worry. However, teachers who picked up on it did not say a word. And I think looking back, I find that really difficult because they knew that I wasn't eating and I think that's another of the reasons that I do what I do so that teachers and people who work with children can start to understand, to look for the signs and to 
um, actually reach out and try and help young people. Um, so, again, this carried on through sixth form. I was ill, but I wasn't ill enough. Um, and I never did feel like I was ill enough to warrant treatment. The worst part was going away to university. And I went to Aberystwyth, which from Manchester was quite a long way. And I was a long way from my parents. I was um, given the freedom to do what I wanted to do. And when you have an eating disorder, what you want to do is the eating disorder. So it took over my life. Um, now your first year of university, you hear a lot about binge drinking and having sex all over the place and you know doing what students do. And they're normally frowned upon, but it's normal. <laughs> Sitting in your bedroom in a dressing gown, not eating and not drinking alcohol because you're scared of the calories is not normal. <clears throat> I spent the whole of my first year of university starving myself. Um, and it wasn't fun. Um, I remember one day I hadn't eaten for a few days and um, I had an online journal um, and someone on there, one of my friends, was just like, Ilona, please, please just eat something. And I remember sitting in my bedroom and crying over a cherry tomato <laughs> because that's how scary it was at that point. Now I got home at the end of first year of university and my mum and dad were in shock. I just looked like a little skeleton girl, horrible. When I look back at photos now, I just can't stand it. Um, and they took me to my GP, who then sent me to the nearest services. Now, it wasn't an inpatient thing. It was just a counsellor. Um, but I was threatened with being sectioned um, because I was a risk to my own health, really. Um, so they gave me a deal. They were like, <laughs> if you stop losing weight, if you lose one more pound, we're going to section you. And for me, that meant leaving university, or at least taking a long break from university, um, and leaving the friends that I'd made, despite being um, in my dressing gown the whole time, I did make friends. Um, now, that was enough to spur me on, to keep me through the rest of university. So I went back. Um, and now this is quite a common thing with people with anorexia when they are <coughs> sent to treatment. If you've been avoiding food for however long, which for me had been quite a few years, you crave the things that you've been restricting. So the first thing I did, I remember, um, was go back to university, unpack all my bags. First thing I did was go to the bakery and buy I think it must have been about this big, box full of cream cakes. Took it back to my room, ate them all, threw them up. That was the first time I'd thrown up. And that kind of set the pattern for the rest of the second and third year of university. But I was determined to get through and I worked hard. I was in a band. I was a singer in a band. And I DJed as well. And I just did everything I could. So I was kind of, I thought I was invincible. I was like, I can do this, I can run, I can eat what I want because I'm not keeping it down. I, can, I just was on overdrive. Um, I bought laxatives and used those. Um, and that led to some of the most humiliating experiences ever. And I also bought pills um, from the internet that I knew would speed up my heart so much that I risked cardiac arrest. <laughs> I did the research and at the point, losing weight or keeping my weight low was more important to me than my own life. I didn't care. I did not care. 
Um, so that was nice. Um, I ended up somehow getting a first in film and TV, did that, graduated, went back home, and um, everything was just completely out of control. I ended up, got to the point where I was being sick up to 20 times a day. Um, and my mum and dad considered just not letting me in the kitchen, actually putting a lock on the kitchen door um, so that I couldn't get in. <laughs> um, I was irritable, I was nasty. If my mum and dad tried to <coughs> say anything, I would snap at them. I was quite evil. <laughs> um, and it got to the point where they were just too scared to say anything at all. Um, it came down to me and my mum, we went on a shopping trip and I remember being in H&M and I was trying on this top and she looked through the door and she saw my back and my back was just disgusting, like a dinosaur, like just bones everywhere. And my mum just started crying. Um, and as nasty as I could be and as irritable as I could be, looking into my mum's eyes and seeing that amount of worry is what finally got to me. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't make her worry anymore. So we went to the doctors again, and I was referred to the inpatient services um, in Stockport. And I went there, spent three months in hospital on an inpatient unit, which was for adults. So it was 16 to, the eldest was 68. Um, and it kind of worked. This is another gray area in um, eating disorders is that people have the idea that recovery is kind of quick, kind of easy, that once you've been in hospital, you're, you know, she's been in now, you know, she'll be fine, she's great. And when I came out, people would say, oh yeah, you look really healthy to an anorexic or a bulimic anyone with an eating disorder, if you say, oh yeah, you're looking really good now, that means, oh, you're fat. Because that's what your brain does to you. It sort of tells you that you're fat when someone's just trying to say anything nice to you. It turns it around. Um, so you couldn't say really that I was recovered after that. Um, I spent... 10 months in outpatient treatment, so going three times a week. Um, but I'm quite a strong character. <coughs> and the woman who led the outpatient services was also a strong character. <laughs> we didn't get on. And we were having a one-to-one -one session once, and um, it, I was clinging to my eating disorder, and I wasn't letting it go. Um, I was gradually losing weight again, and she said, Ilona, what are you scared of? And I said, I'm scared that I won't achieve what I want to achieve. And she said, what do you want to achieve? And I said, apart from losing weight and all that, I really want to work in TV. And she said, Ilona, you might never achieve what you want to achieve. <laughs> that was that <laughs> relapse um it took that one little comment just to send me spiraling and I was like well if I can't achieve that then this is what I can achieve <laughs> losing weight so again uncontrollable this time mainly bulimic behaviors over the anorexic behaviors so it was all just binge purge binge purge binge purge and um one of the things we say is that people with eating disorders aren't necessarily stick thin. They're not necessarily underweight. Now, when this second time round when I relapsed, um, I was binging so much that I actually ended up gaining weight. But <laughs> I felt a million times worse than when I was just restricting and my weight was at its lowest. So. Physically, I was terrible. I could hardly stand up. I was dizzy all the time. I was blacking out. 
I, my brain was all over the place. I couldn't concentrate on anything. All there was in my life was food and the toilet. <laughs> um, so it got to the point this time round where it wasn't my mum that wanted me to go to hospital. I decided myself that I wanted to go in because I couldn't do this anymore. Um, so I took myself to my GP and I said, I really need to go back in. I really need help. Um, I said, I want to get better myself this time. I'm doing it for me. It will work. It will be better use of NHS resources <laughs> because I want to do it this time. Um, and he said, OK. Um, and I went for an interview with a consultant at the unit that I'd been to before. And she said, yep, yeah, great. You know, you need the help. And um, so we'll apply for funding. Uh, this, this is the bad bit. <laughs> uh, the NHS <coughs> sort of sometimes goes along with a stereotype that if you're under a certain BMI, then you are anorexic and you do deserve the treatment. This time, because of the binging, I was over that BMI. Um, and so they refused funding, um, which to me was a massive blow because I just desperately needed this help. In the end, it's quite a long story, but I put my foot down, my GP put his foot down, and the consultant put, put her foot down. We were all writing to each other, we were fighting, and finally, um, I got the stay that I needed. And it was bloody expensive, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but I was in for nine months on an inpatient unit, and that is finally what got me to where I am now. And it was a long journey, it wasn't easy. Um, but I worked hard. I complied to everything that they wanted me to do. And it, again, I wasn't fully recovered at the end, but I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for that stay. So that's a bit about me. Sorry, I went on for quite a while. Um, now what I do and what I started doing when I was at my last stay in hospital was, um, I started writing and um, my first degree is in film and TV, my second I did a master's in journalism. So I wanted to use my experiences to help others, to spread awareness and to educate people about the preventable measures that we may be able to take to catch eating disorders before they get to the point where you need such a long stay in hospital or irreversible physical damage happens. So I wrote to um, every newspaper that I could think of, except the Daily Mail and the Sun. Um, <laughs> and I said, I just pitched the idea. I said, right, I'm a journalist. I was lying a little bit because I wasn't really a journalist yet. Um, and I said, I just want to tell my story and I'd really like to write about um, my stay in an inpatient unit. And so it started as someone from the independent called me um, and we talked through the idea and I sort of said, this is what I want to do. And he said, great. So from then I had a blog and it started off just being about my stay in hospital, but then it moved on to recovery after that. And now it's sort of every time anything comes up in the media to do with eating disorders or body image, they'll be like, Elena, can you just write about this? And I'll be like, yeah. Um, so that's what I do now. Um, now this talk, I called it insatiable because, and I saw that as well on my way in, and it kind of sums up everything that I wanted to say, and it's that... I feel like eating disorders can be described as insatiable because no matter what it is, whether you're restricting or binging or purging, you're trying to fill some kind of a hunger and not a physical hunger 
but you're trying to make up for something that's missing. It could be anything. Um, for me, I found that it was massively attached to the idea of achievement and like saying at school that I was never quite as good as my sisters. I was as good at them at losing weight or better than them. Um, not the best achievement that I could think of, but um, it worked for a while for the short term before I got ill. Um, and I think, it's, uh, sorry. And I think identity, you know, is a, a massive thing um, because I had so many other things in my life that were taken away from me by the eating disorder. And the eating disorder creeps up on you and it takes over all of those little bits. Um, we talked before a little bit about control and a lot of people have the idea in their heads that eating disorders are all about control. And it can start off like that, but with me, I was aware almost the whole way through actually that it was controlling me and that I was out of control. Because maybe more so with bulimia than anorexia, but there is no control at all in bulimia. <laughs> um, not at all. It might feel like it because you're sort of calories in, calories out. It sounds like that. But when you're getting up at seven in the morning and all you want to do is stay in bed, yet you're automatically on your way to the supermarket to fill up your basket with food that you can hardly afford just to throw it all down the loo, that's not control. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit as well about the myths and the stereotypes um, about eating disorders. There's an awful lot of misconceptions that people believe about eating disorders and that's, you know, we're not to blame for that because we learn about eating disorders from a whole range of sources and not all of them are all that reliable. Again, the Daily Mail, for one. Um, I'm not a fan. Um, th there's quite a few here. I'm just going to list a few. And these are myths. So you have to be skeletal to have an eating disorder. Eating disorders are all about food. Everyone with an eating disorder is anorexic. Those who strive to be thin do so because the fashion world tells us that's how they should look. Eating disorders are a diet gone too far. They only affect young, white, gifted females. They are just a phase. Recovery is quick and easy. I find that one quite laughable. Uh, the, these come from all over the place, and like I said, no one's to blame for believing these things, but here's a few truths to kind of counteract those. Anorexia only counts for 10% of all eating disorders. 80% of people who suffer with eating disorders are normal or overweight. Eating disorders are so complex that after 20 years, I still don't understand mine. The media and fashion worlds are often the first to be blamed. It's quite easy to blame them. Um, that is quite a debate in itself because they don't cause eating disorders, but a lot of the time they don't help either, especially in recovery. Uh, eating disorders affect anyone, regardless of sex, race, background, and media representations of eating disorders don't help go against that stereotype. They often fulfill it. Um, and recovery, again, when you spoke before, you spoke about um, recovery to a full degree, so full recovery we talk about. And I asked, you know, how do you know when you're fully recovered? Because after, I've been out of hospital for four years and I felt like I was fully recovered, but just before Christmas I had a small lapse and I sort of thought, oh, I thought I was fully recovered. And um, it's just not that simple. And some people think that 
part of it will always be there in the back of your mind for the rest of your life, but I really, really hope it's not. <laughs> um, but just to say again that a short stay in hospital doesn't cure or treat fully all of the deep seated issues that fuel an eating disorder. Um, I just want to read a little bit out of my book about um, the, like I said before, we all like to point the finger and have something to blame um, for eating disorders. So I just want to read a little bit of this. The person with an eating disorder blames him or herself. Their parents blame themselves. The tabloids bl blame the fashion industry. The fashion industry blames nobody. Partners and friends don't know who to blame. The public blame, uh, sorry, the public blame modern culture, celebrities, whatever or whoever they're told to blame by the media. The media, strangely, tends to blame the media. Our culture of blame is quite a mess. What is clear though, is that we all feel the need to point the finger at someone or something. We have an overwhelming urge to hold up something and say, you're a disgrace, look what you've done. We do this too often without thinking it through. As soon as we make a connection that sounds feasible, there's our explanation, job done. Once we make this observation and everything clicks into place, we're satisfied with ourselves and stop looking beyond that. We can then direct all our anger, frustrations and bitterness at whatever this thing is, in the hope that venting and ranting will solve everything or at least make us feel a bit better. <coughs> it is our nature to want answers, especially where illness is concerned. We want to know what is wrong, what will happen, how it will affect us, how long for, and what treatment is. Most of all, why? And it's quite a strange comparison to make, but looking at the blame thing, um, I'm sure you're all aware of the Columbine Massacre or Michael Moore's film about it. Um, now, when he was sort of interviewing people, he looked at who people blamed for that. And uh, lots of people blamed video games and some people blamed Marilyn Manson <coughs> because as a bit of a hate figure, they thought they were being copycats and copying that violence. Um, now, Michael Moore um, interviewed Marilyn Manson and he said, if there was one thing you could say to the people of Columbine, what would you say? And he said, I wouldn't say anything, I would listen. And I just think that says a lot because if you ask people who have eating disorders or who have had eating disorders who's to blame, they wouldn't want anyone to guess for them or come up with these answers, they'd want to tell you themselves. And a lot of the time, what journalists and reporters and writers and TV programmes, everything about eating disorders often says something that people with eating disorders wouldn't agree with. And that's that it's the fashion world, it's models, it's celebrities. I find it quite offensive to be honest um, that people think that years of um, starving and just self-hating and um, self just self-hate and you know all that violence that an eating disorder puts on yourself is the result of you reading heat magazine you know, it's quite simplistic and it's patronising that you could simplify something to that extent. Um, so, I mean, you know, when I was seven, I didn't know what size zero was. I didn't know who Nicole Ritchie was. <laughs> and I didn't know anything that we blame now at that age. It was all seeds growing inside my head and they were all to do with feelings and emotions and not at all to do with what I saw on the TV. Um, 
So, where am I up to? Sorry. Um, there are some people who blame, um, obviously not entirely, but sometimes that parents can have an impact or play a part in development of someone's eating disorder. Now, I worry at the moment that there's sort of people my age and in their 30s or 40s who are coming into this culture where we're sort of, everyone's trying fad diets. And I know that diets aren't a new thing, but New Year this year, I was looking at the front pages of all the magazines and almost, I think there are about two magazines on the whole shelf that weren't covered in the 5-2 diet. It was 5-2-5-2-5-2-5-2-5-2 on every single front page. And so many of us are getting caught into that and people of that age are dieting and children will pick up on this, whether they're your nieces or nephews or children themselves. Um, and I do think that people that age shouldn't be looking at labels, thinking about calories, counting calories, or being in the presence of someone who is cutting out entire food groups or not eating for a whole two days a week. Um, I just think that's really, really dangerous. Now, coming back to, um, sorry, the Daily Mail, it's just something that I can't stand. And again, what I talk about is the myths and stereotypes that we see to do with eating disorders. And um, this week, because it's Eating Disorders Awareness Week and because I'm a bit of a journalist, I like to stay on top of the coverage. So every morning I'll Google anorexia or bulimia or eating disorders and click on news. Every day this week, <coughs> the Daily Mail has had a story about anorexia. Every day I've looked at that story and you see pictures of skinny, really, really emaciated people, details of low weights and of how they got to that weight. And these are what I call real life stories about eating disorders. Now, to a lot of people, people would say any press is good press and it's trying to do a good thing, it's trying to raise awareness. But magazines like this, called the Daily Mail magazine, uh, tabloids like this and magazines um, will do these real life stories but they sensationalise them, they glamorise them and they perpetuate the stereotype that every single person with an eating disorder has to look like this. Um, eating disorders are massively competitive. It's one of the most dangerous things about even being in an inpatient unit because when I was in there, everyone's comparing themselves to each other. And even though you're a patient in a hospital, you're thinking, I don't deserve to be here because I'm not as thin as her. I'm the fattest one here. Everyone in an eating disorders unit think that they're the fattest one there. Um, and, you know, you find that people are looking at each other, people are comparing. When it's weigh-in day, everyone's like, oh, how did you do? And it's like, they don't want to know how they did. They want to know if they've gained weight, if you've lost weight, or the other way around. It's, you know, quite a nasty atmosphere sometimes. It can be supportive too, but it can be that the competitive side of the illness overtakes the rest. Um, so I'm coming back to the real life stories. Um, when someone with an eating disorder sees these real life stories, they look and they see, oh, she was five stone. I'm not anorexic. I'm not ill enough to deserve treatment. If they're seven stone, maybe. Um, and it is this bad. And uh, Beat, the charity, I'm sure you've all heard of them, actually have um, guidelines for reporters, which papers like the Daily Mail or New Magazine, 
blatantly ignore. They know they exist because I tell them every day. Um, but they blatantly ignore them. And these are to avoid people with eating disorders looking at them and being triggered by them and their eating disorder possibly being made worse by that. They're also pe perpetuating all of the myths and the stereotypes that I listed before. But these stories have to sell. So they talk about the extremes. They'll talk about the fattest person in the UK. They'll talk about the thinnest person in the UK. <coughs> They'll talk about the person who purges 70 times a day, not the people who purge 10 times a day. Because it's all about extremes with those papers. And what we need to remember is that it's not about the extremes. The thing is that the reality of eating disorders is that they're quite mundane and boring and monotonous. And they're that boring and monotonous that that's why they don't get in the press. And that's why we make so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about them because the things that we should learn are the things that are probably right in front of our very eyes. Thank you.